we'll get started. Appreciate everybody being here this evening. I hope you've, it's me. Um, hope everybody has studied and has lots of good comments to make tonight. Um, this section of 1 Timothy 2, as I alluded to earlier, of course, full of uh, very easy concepts and things that nobody has any disputes, discussions, or debates about, so we'll, we'll, we'll breeze right through this. Uh, no, we, we may or may not get through this tonight. Um, and, you know, I've tried to study these things and, and, and get a good handle on them so we can have a good discussion about it, and I hope you have as well. Um, Brother Michael, would you care to lead us in a word of prayer? Amen. <clears throat> so we left off um, Sunday uh, there in verse 8, in the, the beginning of this section. Uh, thank you. In the beginning of this section, uh, he begins um, by, by saying that, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So before we get into all these things about roles of women and, and all that, he makes this statement sort of transitioning from this section on prayer and the importance of prayer. And again, all of this being, you know, sort of a continuous logical thread, he's talking about the problems that are, that are going on that, that Timothy needs to address here uh, in the Ephesian church. And he's saying that the first thing that's got to happen is, is we've got to have prayer. We've got to have diligent, fervent prayer, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving, supplications. And he says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And, and I think the first thing we can see from that is he is, he is commanding, he is commanding Timothy to charge the men of this church to lead. He's, he's charging Timothy to charge these men uh, to be the kind of men who, who lead the church in prayer, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. And uh, we talked a little bit about that idea of, of Bolami and Theo and Thalo, and that this was, you know, something that he was commanding to be done. Um, and he's saying there that this needed to be done everywhere. And, and I think the context there of, of, of why he makes that, that distinction uh, is that the people at this time, whether they be Jews or pagans, where did they feel like prayers were at least weightier to be offered? In, in their temples, whether it be in the synagogues, whether it be in pagan temples, uh, they felt like that that was... Um, the place where one ought to pray and, and the place that perhaps they carried more, uh, more weight. And, and some will reference in that uh, John 4 there where Jesus is speaking of the woman at the well um, and, and he tells her that, you know, right now you worship here in Jerusalem, but there is a, there is a time coming. Uh, he says there, starting in verse 21, uh, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Uh, you worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know, and we worship, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit 
and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. So that idea of spirit and truth worship, I think, is what we're talking about here, that, that these men need to lead prayers and, and do so in, in a pious, uh, righteous, and upright way. Um, what did you get as far as the impression of what is meant here by wrath and doubting, which is also sometimes translated in different variations as anger and quarreling? What, is, he, is he talking about prayers, or is he talking about the people, the people offering the prayers? Right. Right. He's talking about the unity of the church there. And some, I read some people try to make this about the prayers themselves, and I'm not sure I quite understand that. I can certainly see where we might be, have some sort of wrathful or quarreling prayers. Uh, but I think more what he's saying here is, is the kind of men that these men ought to be are the kind of men who pray, who have holy hands to lift up uh, and, and are serving and leading together without wrath uh, or anger, without quarreling or doubting, uh, and, and leading the church in that kind of, of faith and unity uh, that, that God demands of us. Any thoughts or disagreements with that? And this idea of, of holy hands, is that, I mean, are we erring by by not holding our, our palms upright when we pray? What, what is that about? Okay. So it, it was a custom of, of the time, and, and we see it go back uh, many generations. Uh, you can go back to 1 Kings 8. Uh, we see holding upturned hands was an ancient practice of prayer. <laughs> and you see it in numerous places signifying respect, submission, and reliance on God. As Ms. Carroll says also, uh, you know, this idea of not concealing anything, uh, this physical act to kind of signify how our heart should be uh, in that we're not concealing anything from God. Um, so this is more about a posture of prayer rather than a, not a physical posture, but a physical posture that reflects our inner posture. And so what do we do today? How do we signify our submission, our obedience, our reverence to God? We, often we, we do it by bowing our heads. Is that the only way that we can do that? No. There are lots of ways that you can... You can do that and, and, and signify those things. Some people will, um, will go down prostrate and they'll kneel. Um, some people will hold up their hands, and, and there's certainly not a problem with that so long as uh, the intent behind it is correct. Any, any thoughts or comments about any of that before we move on? Talking to a bunch tonight. I'm going to start bringing uh, caffeine for you guys. Okay, so now we get in the fun part, right? Uh, so the next uh, passage here, the next section of this, he begins to talk about uh, the conduct of women in the church. And, and I think it's important to note here once again but he begins, verse 9, by saying, in like manner also. And so what is Paul emphasizing by saying in like manner? What is, he, what is, what is the likeness here to? Some have tried to use that to argue that, well, I mean, in like manner, so that means that women should also be doing all these things that men are doing, that, that, that women should be um, praying everywhere and, and, and doing anything that men can do. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit more as we go along. But I think the context here, he's saying that just as he desires that the men lead, he's saying, and, and likewise, what, what's going to help the church, what's going to help the church grow in unity and love and faith is that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair, gold or pearls or costly clothing. 
And so trying to establish some kind of context about what we're talking about here, and, and there's not a lot of specific things said about, about why he brings these specific things up. But if we think about the context of this book and, and, and what's going on, again, this is Paul writing to Timothy, who is working with the Ephesian church. And we know later on in 1 Timothy here, there's a whole big section about the issue with widows. And so we know that there is an issue in this church with widows. And we know that there's an issue in, in how the church is taking care of the true widows and making sure that those who are not true widows are not taking advantage of uh, that status uh, when, as, as Paul commands there, that they should be uh, doing other things. They should be seeking uh, to live their lives, uh, seeking husbands or, you know, they're, they're young women and, and, and they should not be considered, as he says, as true widows. And we're going to get into all that later on. So the context here being what little we know about what's going on here, there are widows, uh, and there are some who were perhaps trying to uh, take advantage, and so that may uh, leave us a little bit of an idea of what some of the issues were. We see there in uh, chapter 5 and verse 6, um, he says, But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And then over in verse uh, 13, and besides they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not. And then in verse 15, for some have already turned aside after Satan. So I think we can see here that, that clearly um, there are concerns, there are uh, concerns about the things that, that might happen uh, with some of the women in this congregation and, and the effect that uh, their lives may have on the rest of the church. And so he's commanding them, first of all, uh, to modesty. And he, he uses the phrase there to adorn themselves in respectable apparel. And I always think it's interesting when we talk about modesty. What do we immediately run to and talk about and, and, and go on and on and on about endlessly? Clothing, right? We talk about clothing. And are there issues with clothing and modesty? Absolutely. But is modesty only a clothing problem? No. Modesty is absolutely not only a clothing problem. Uh, interestingly, from what we read in these passages and these letters when we talk about modesty, in, 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 particularly here in 1 Timothy, was there a problem of people not wearing enough clothing? It seems kind of the opposite problem, right? It's, pardon me, Carol? Right. I mean, one, one could say that maybe they were wearing too much clothing in the sense of that we were, we were having a fashion show or we were having a, a, a fashion competition. Uh, attention. Right. For not the right Seeking attention through, uh, through dress, through um, jewelry, through uh, hairstyles. Uh, from some of the things I've read, apparently in, in this day and age, it was a common thing to do up the hair and then add a lot of jewelry to it and try to, you know, make a spectacle uh, out of it. Um, and, and so there was an issue here of modesty, certainly in, in, in appearance, but where does that modesty issue come from? Right. It emanates from the heart. Um, and I, I thought about these two verses here, and if somebody would turn over to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Somebody read that for me real quick. All of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Okay, and now Romans 13 and verse 14.
Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Okay. So when we talk about someone who has been baptized, someone who has uh, been washed uh, in, in baptism, someone who has put on Christ, I think that imagery is not just used uh, to say that they've, um, that they've been baptized or they've been saved or whatever, but we're talking about something that becomes us. We're talking about something that we take on and it, it, it should emanate from our hearts. It should take over our hearts and our minds, but it should also be expressed outwardly in, in, in the way that we conduct ourselves, in the way that we appear. And so when we talk about modesty, it's not merely about, well, this is the exact length of things and how they should be, whether it's knees or ankles. It's about our hearts, which is not to say that those other things aren't important and they're not a part of it and we don't need to have standards. But so often we get focused on that and we deal with the symptoms rather than the disease. Because you can be fully burk it up and still have a heart problem and still have an immodest spirit. Yes, Miss Carol. Right. So he says to clothe ourselves in good works. And so that is, that is part of a modest lifestyle, right? The, the kind of things that ought to be expressed uh, by our lives and, and our actions. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses uh, 3 through 4. If somebody would read that for us quickly. Okay, so a similar uh, passage here, a similar idea. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. Uh, giving that idea that this is not just about um, clothing and, and that arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel, some way you even have the idea that that is how we show um, whatever we want to show to the world uh, some may, may, t may even think that, well, this is how I show the world uh, that God has blessed me, right? And, and, and we see that attitude. We see that in the health and wealth uh, sort of uh, doctrine that we, in, in the world today. But he's saying, rather than that, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. As Miss Carol alluded to earlier, that it, it's, a, it's about the things that we express in our lives, the way that we serve uh, without seeking attention, without seeking glory and honor for ourselves, but glory and honor uh, for God. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. You know, if, if God has, has blessed us and, and we want to honor him and serve him uh, because of that. I would hope that we would want to do that in, in faithful service and in, in faithful submission to his will and authority. Any, uh, any thoughts, any, anything anybody wants to add to that? So I think it's very purposeful and, and very important to realize that he begins this section here talking about the role of women in the church by talking about modesty and, and talking about the kind of hearts and the kind of attitudes uh, that ought to be 
prevalent. Um, and while this modesty issue, uh, and, and specifically the, the issue with braided hair and gold and pearls and costly clothing was probably very much an, an issue uh, of that moment in that day, it's a universal thought. It's a universal idea that, that humility uh, and, and modesty ought to be the attitude that we have and then he takes that on into um, this, this next section here uh, about silence and submission. Um, somebody read for us verses 10 through 12. Okay, so, so transitioning from modesty to submission uh, and, and silence here, uh, he says, that which is proper for women professing godliness with good works, let a woman learn in silence. And I think th this is something that, that I only kind of recently really understood and, and learned is that the word here that's used for silence, uh, the, the, there's two passages we might look at that talk about this issue in silence. So let's t some, turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 34. Somebody read that for us. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy, we see here this word silence. Translated in English, is the same word as silence. Are these the same Greek words? They are not. And I think it's interesting to understand that as we sort of look at these questions of what does this mean in terms of, of silence and submission. If we look at the context of 1 Corinthians, um, he's talking about, very specifically, um, the, the assembly of the church, the assembled church for worship. Going back to verse 26, he says, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, and he, and he goes through uh, these issues that they have in their worship services. Now, going back to 1 Timothy, um, there's really nothing specific said here about worship. Uh, he's talking about the relationship of men and women, the, the submission uh, that, that, that women have unto men, um, and, and the authority that men have uh, within the church broadly. And he says, and he talks about specifically about teaching. Uh, and, and the words that are used here are actually different words. First Timothy uses the word, and again, not a Greek pronunciation expert, hesuchia, hesuchia, uh, however you like, but it means quietness, and it, 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 it denotes a, a quiet and humble or submissive spirit. Uh, and you'll read in different uh, translation dictionaries. And in 1 Corinthians, uses the word sigeo, meaning to keep silent. It's very specific there, to keep silent. Why is that important? Well, I think it's important because the, a lot of times this, this verse and this idea gets, um, gets used to bring up conflicts. It gets used to bring up, well, is this or that um, a conflict with... Um, with this verse? How can you say that, that women have to keep silent? Can we not sing? Well, I sure hope so, because I would say on average the women in this group sound a lot better singing than 
a lot of the men, um, and I think we, we appreciate that. And there are a lot of different things that come up with it. And so in this context here, talking about teaching, you know, in this very Bible class, um, I certainly don't have a problem with, uh, with women making comments, with, with speaking up, reading scriptures. Um, and, and I don't think that there's a um, problem there of, of authority. Um, so let's, let's look at some of these questions that get raised and, and, and see how we can understand them. Does this mean that a woman can never teach? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Let's, let's look at some examples here. Titus chapter 2 and verse 4. Somebody read that for us. Okay, there is, there is a, a, a duty uh, for, for the older women to uh, teach the younger women uh, how, they ought to, how they ought to be, to, uh, to love their hu husbands, to love their children, to, to, to do the things that, that God requires of them. Women certainly have uh, a role to teach one another in that way. Acts chapter 18 and verse 26 uh, what happened here with Aquila and Priscilla? This is a husband and wife. What did they do? Acts chapter 18 and verse 26. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So this is a husband and a wife going and teaching someone. Now, did Priscilla usurp anyone's authority here? I don't think so. And we see here a husband and wife going together, Priscilla along with her husband. Now, would there have been a problem if Priscilla had taken Apollos aside and said, now you listen here? I think there might be an issue there. But we see there that she went along with her husband. And then, not, not for nothing here, 2 Timothy 1 and 5, Paul commends the faith of Timothy, Timothy's mother and grandmother. And, and I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that they probably teach Timothy some things. I imagine they did. I imagine they did. They taught young Timothy faith in God. So, so I also went down the proverbial YouTube rabbit hole. Uh, in, in if, if you just type in uh, 1 Timothy 2 into YouTube, uh, have fun. Uh, there's, there's a lot out there about it. And, and some I was actually surprised and impressed by. Uh, there, are a lot of, uh, there was a lot of good scholarship about it uh, and people who had you know, honest and, and sincere uh, points of view about it. Um, but I was particularly struck by one. Uh, it was a female, uh, she would refer to herself, I think, as a female pastor uh, who was uh, obviously being a female pastor. This verse and, and, and the verse in, in uh, Corinthians uh, presents a problem. And her way around this was saying, well, Paul is talking to Timothy here only about the church at Ephesus. This only applies here. Because you had all these rich widows, and they're just beating up on Timothy. 
there's nothing of the sort indicated in the text about that. Uh, the, and, and I think we're going to get into that here in just a moment about how, how on earth people come up with the idea that this is not a, a universal commandment um, when clearly it is. But so I think we can see clearly that there are times, there are examples where women can certainly teach. And we have lots of amazing women that right now teaching our children. Uh, and, and we have lots of, of, of great and amazing women who are teaching one another. We have the women's studies here. Um, you know, so often we get bogged down by talking about what women can't do. And we fail to talk about all the things that women can and absolutely should be doing. And, and, and are God-ordained and commanded to do. And so we want to worry about this idea of, of equality instead of uh, worrying about the roles that God has created for us. Well, some will say, well, in Galatians, and let's I spell Galatians wrong. That makes sense. Galatians chapter 3 In verse 28, somebody read Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29 for me. There is, never, there is neither, sorry, Jew or Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, so uh, you'll hear a lot of different arguments about comparing uh, this idea with the idea here in 1 Timothy. Well, if there is neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, that we're all one in Christ Jesus, well, how can you say that women can't do anything men can do, that women can't be preachers and teachers and elders and uh, whatever else, when, when Paul clearly says here that there's, there's no such thing as male or female in the church? And obviously, that is taking this passage uh, a bit far from what it's saying. Um, I've even heard there's a lot of people who will argue that Paul didn't even write this either this section or the whole book of or the whole letter of First Timothy because they say that this conflicts uh, with Galatians. Uh, to which I say, well, maybe he didn't write Galatians if we're going to, you know, if we're just going to start throwing things out because uh, we don't like them. Um, but I don't think there's a conflict there at all, is there? I, I, it, what, what is he saying about this equality? How are we equal in Christ? Absolutely. So there is a unity and diversity uh, within the body of Christ. But this unity that he's talking about here, I think, in Galatians is what he talks about in verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. Just because my role and your role is different, is our reward different? Is our heirship different? Is their inheritance different? No. Our salvation in Christ is the same. Our value to him in the kingdom is the same. Yes, sir. It is anything else that changes what, what Paul wrote in Galatians would have been radical because women were heirs. Yeah. Um, and now... Right. 
only thing that's changed is the world has been around them. Right. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's important to, to, to think about when, when Paul was writing Galatians. I think maybe that was the point he was trying to make. Like that, that was a radical thought um, that, that women could be heirs and Gentiles could be heirs, and that's that, that might be the key to that passage. Right. And, and so, I mean, when we think about the ancient world. Uh, did did women have a lot of equality then? I think even verse fifty two would have been radical. Right. That, that it would have been too like I, I can't like forget have some Gopher man. I can't believe they're less you know within a hundred yards of of, of the church. The assembly, yeah, they're allowed to learn. Right. Like just that comment that they're they're allowed to learn even, like that that would have been radical. Uh, sure. In his day. Yeah. Well, absolutely. We we. We oftentimes, as you alluded to, we, we focus on sort of trying to wrangle the scriptures into our world rather than looking at their context and then allowing it to inform how we view the world today. And so let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and, and just quickly look at verses 12 through 19 because I think this uh, this idea of this this unity and diversity in the body here, and this this can be um, used to to understand a lot of things uh, about the church, but I also think it applies here to understanding how even though our roles are different, that doesn't make one greater or lesser uh, than another in terms of its spiritual value. First Corinthians chapter twelve. Somebody read verses twelve through nineteen for us quickly. He says the body is one, and it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though they may be, they are many, are one body, also, uh, so also is Christ. But the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink, one, drink of one spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. If the foot says, because... Uh, I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. If it is not, if, if it is not for this reason, any less than any part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, then it is not for any reason, any less than a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were the hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has arranged the parts, each and every one of them, in the body, just as he desired. And they were all one part, where would the body be? Okay, so he uses this example of, of the body and, and, the, and the parts of the, that make up our physical bodies and how different they are. And, and he points out the absurdity of saying that, that if everything is the same, then what is a body? I mean, if I was just one giant foot, I guess I would be really stable. But I wouldn't be good for much else but standing here. I couldn't hear. I couldn't hear any of your comments, and I couldn't, couldn't tell you anything I've studied because I couldn't have studied anything because I'd have no eyes. And, and you know, we, the, the difference in... Uh, ask my wife. The, the thumb is a small member of the body, yes? Ask her what it's like to not have one work for the last three, four months. Try to, try to grab something without your thumb one of these days. See how you like it. It's not fun. It makes it difficult. All these different parts of the body play crucial and important roles, and as we talked about earlier, just because God ordained Different roles for men and women does not mean that women are lesser, doesn't mean that, that God hates women or the church hates women or that men hate women. It means that we have different roles and God designed us to play different parts. And I think Paul's argument here that he makes and, and, and the absurdity of saying that, that this only applies to the Ephesians is the very argument that Paul makes. What does he use to explain his, his argument here? Where does he go? He goes to creation. 
He goes back to the very beginning. And he says, Adam and Eve, in the beginning, were made man and woman. Right? We, that's a thing we seem to be struggling with a lot these days uh, in our world. He created them, woman and man, man and woman. And so if he's going back to the creation to make this argument, I think we see the, the universality of it. Is that a word? Michael says thumbs up. Uh, but he's saying here that woman uh, was created, or that man was created first, woman was created after man, um, and that the woman was deceived first. But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And so uh, we see also in 1 Corinthians, and we're running out of time uh, here to, to get into all this, and we're going to be off next week, so we'll I'll have to try to pick it up, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 8 and 9, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. Um, so he's talking here about the, the way that God designed and created and ordained the roles of men and women to be. Um, and as we see in 1 Timothy uh, 2 and verse 15, 5 and 14, and Titus 2, 5, these verses talking about uh, the roles of women in, in the church, the roles of women in the home, uh, paint a picture of what the God-ordained relationship between woman and man is. That it ought to be men leading in godliness, women serving in godliness, and children being raised in godliness. And, and certainly we can talk about all these different exceptions and examples of you know, is he saying there in, in the last verse that only mothers will be saved? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He's talking about that women who, who serve in godliness and faith um, will be saved and that they will uh, have that same uh, inheritance. Um, and, and certainly look at Proverbs 31. You know, that absolutely destroys the idea of, quote, just a homemaker. Is the Proverbs 31 just a anything? No. No. And, and, and nothing that she is doing outside of the home is interfering with her work inside the home and vice versa. And so we see throughout the scripture when we study uh, in honesty and, and earnestness what God has designed for the roles of men and women to be, uh, we see the beauty of his plan. We see the beauty of his creation. Yes, sir. You know, of all the things that the world has managed to corrupt for us, um, the idea of submission may be one that's pretty corrosive and up there on the list of things that we need to watch and make sure it doesn't corrupt in us. That if submit is an ugly word, then, then we've let the world influence us. Right. That, that the Bible definition there to submit, to be submissive to somebody that loves you and has your best has your best interest at heart is a profoundly beautiful thing. Yeah. And uh, and that is very countercultural. And in the and it's easy to let that slip into our psyches that to submit is to be weak or to submit is to give in or to submit is to inferior um, that's, that's, not, that's not the biblical view right and, it, and it's that it's that creeping um, in a, a, a worldly influence you know the I always think about the you know the what is the most basic TV trope it's the dumb husband right uh, it, it's it's all those things that creep in and make us forget what men should be leading and, and it's being submissive to God and, and to Christ first and foremost and, and, and being in submission to him and, and having that burden of submission to lead his family, to lead his wife in, in, in righteousness. And then the wife submitting to his leadership because he is submitted and being led by God. And so when we have that in harmony then none of these things should be a problem. And Tim's back there looking through the window like, shut up. 
Thank you, guys. Um, meeting next week, so won't have any class for, for the week, but hopefully we'll all remember everything in, a, in another week.